SBS advises that the following program contains content that may disturb some viewers. Hello, police. What's your emergency? I've been stabbed. Is there any serious bleeding? This is seriously a lot of blood. Can I ask who you are? I'm not doing anything. Before the world went into lockdown, Britain was swamped by an epidemic of knife crime. Britain's knife crime epidemic has already claimed its 10th teenage victim and the 21st in London this year. By the start of 2020, knife attacks were being reported daily in the UK, many of them in London. I need an ambulance now. I've been stabbed in my shade. But the knife crime disease had spread to other major cities. Last year, there were 43,000 knife crimes in England and Wales. Now, that's a record high, and 300 of those were fatal. Now, while the numbers are quite high in London, we've come to Birmingham because this is the place where knife crime is growing the fastest in the country. It's Saturday night, just days before British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will announce a UK-wide lockdown to prevent the spread of coronavirus. I'm about to meet a specialist team of trauma doctors, paramedics and nurses from the West Midlands care team. It's a Saturday night, but obviously with the current coronavirus issue, then perhaps it's going to be a little different to our usual Saturday night. We'll see. Some nights we could probably have 15 stabbings within the Birmingham region. Anything ranging from just small cuts that have been caused by intentional stab wounds all the way through to life-ending injuries. In the past year, knife crime has risen by almost 20% in the Birmingham area. That's around 500 more cases than the previous year. Oh yeah, did you say there were two patients? One in the chest. Two people have been stabbed. One has been stabbed in the chest. Uh, ourselves and another doctor-led resource are going to be going to this. We should be there in about eight minutes. Sounds like it's in a house. Yeah, and it's not safe yet. The crew must wait until the scene is secure. Check with the police. There's no one on route currently because they have no resources. So I told them we're standing by. They're aware of that. Eventually. Dr. Ben is allowed to enter the accident scene. Do you want to just go and have a look at the chest wound quickly? Just... There's two injured people. One's got a minor hand injury and then the other one's got a very super chest wound. So we, we'll take every stab into the chest seriously, um, but obviously we need to do an assessment of it because it could be quite minor. Uh, we'll prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Um, if it is just a minor injury, then our skill set isn't required. Thanks very much. The wounded man was treated by regular ambulance medics and taken to hospital. Dr Ben says knife crime victims are getting younger. There normally is a component of intoxication to play, but yeah, it, it tends to be related to drugs and gang war. And gangs are using a horrifying new type of attack that aims to leave its victims permanently disabled. It's called bagging. They're either stabbing them in the abdomen or in the rectum so that they're needing quite extensive bowel surgery. Um, and often that's resulting in them needing a stoma bag uh, for the rest of their life. And obviously that doesn't carry the cred anymore. Um, so they can't carry on as a, as a senior gang member. This team would normally deal with multiple attacks each shift. They tell us people are staying indoors because of the threat of coronavirus. Less congregation means less chance of young gang members clashing. So just one call out is unusually quiet. And that one call out could have been for someone like Daniel Baird. One Saturday night in July 2017, Daniel was having a normal night out with his mates at the pub. There was just some altercation during in the pub, 
uh, I think it was just over someone bumping into someone else and that's what it was over. It was a night that Dan's mum, Lynn, wishes she could forget. The other party waited for Dan's friend outside the pub and Dan's friend went in and told Dan and Dan went outside and then this other person, he got a knife out straight away. This CCTV footage of the attack shows the other man slashing Dan's friend and then stabbing Dan. It was a stab wound just under the heart. I heard, you know, a stab wound to the chest. Dan just kept bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Nobody knew what to do. Another friend saw Dan bleeding heavily and got both men into the back of his car. And just drove straight to the hospital, which was a straight run up the road from that pub. And it was only about three minutes away, but it was too late. We died at four minutes past five in the morning. And that was it. I never saw Dan again. He never came home. And that was it. Just around the corner from Lynn's house, we meet Ray Ann, who grew up here in this deprived and at times violent suburb. She's seen many knife attacks like the one that killed Dan, thanks to her own troubled past. I turned to crime because obviously I had to bring myself up. I never really had family. My mum was in hospital, my dad wasn't there, so I had to provide for myself. I was a professional shoplifter. We'd go and into shops, into stores and take probably 10 items per shop. You could earn, could earn roughly about £1,000 a week between us. She was caught three times and narrowly escaped jail. It was a life surrounded by danger. It's obviously the older lot back then. Uh, noise was ever said, everybody carried a knife. I do have a personal experience of my daughter's dad stabbing my boyfriend at the time, just round the corner. He stabbed him seven times, um, obviously over me. I'm not very proud of that. Uh, but yeah, so I, I have been involved in situations where knives have been used and nearly killed people. I wouldn't say it was necessarily as bad as what it is today. And the lad that I was with was obviously feared then because he used knives and people knew that if anybody gets on the wrong side of him, he has no fear to use a knife. Is that something that plays into the way knives are used today? Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, in what way? If the, the bigger the knife a young person has, the more respect they will get off their peers. Yeah, yeah. Almost half the children in this suburb live in poverty. There is higher than average unemployment and violent crime has been steadily rising. There is no community, there's no sense of community whatsoever. A lot of neighbours probably don't even know each other's names. Ray-Ann says in suburbs like this, unless parents have got the money to pay for after-school activities, there's no way to keep teenagers off the streets. So this is Beaton Road Youth Centre. We might be able to walk through. It was through there, yeah. It was this building round the back of here. The one place that kids could go were local community centres such as this. But many like this one were closed by government austerity cuts. I was robbed of my childhood because of the streets. From the age of 11, I was robbed of my childhood. I believe if youth centres was still around, it would give kids the opportunity to stay kids for longer instead of having to grow up and fend for themselves at such a young age. Austerity cuts haven't just hit social services. Starting in 2010, the Conservative government's cuts slashed many areas of public spending. With the UK government now trying to spend its way out of a looming coronavirus recession, there's going to be even less money for public services. Since government austerity cuts started in 2010, the West Midlands police have lost about 2,000 police officers. That's about a quarter of their entire force. And that's forced some communities to take matters into their own hands. With knife crime rising fast, Nice to meet you. I'm Salim Ahmed. Salim, nice to meet you. Salim is stepping in where he believes the government has failed, 
with a community policing unit. Some of the problems we've had in our community is knife crime, gang violence, uh, and that's largely down to a reduction in policing. So as a community, we've had to take the responsibility uh, to effectively police our streets. The purpose was to have a visible presence on the streets uh, to tackle crime, uh, to tackle antisocial behaviour, and to reduce the amount of crime we see amongst young people. In terms of knife crime, what have you been seeing happen over the past few years? It's escalated uh, drastically. Uh, members of our congregation, young boys, uh, who have just been walking the streets after attending the mosque have been stabbed and fatally stabbed. Uh, we had a member of congregation, a 19-year-old uh, lad who I knew personally, uh, who was sta stabbed and killed uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that's our knife bin. That was placed here as a part of a campaign to reduce oh, right, uh, knife thing. violence. Yeah. So Has that worked at all? It has worked. So we, we've had it here for about five years and every uh, every six months or so we'll empty it out. So you fill it every six months? So it is being filled, it is being filled. Other ones who weren't the bad ones. We're joining Salim and his team on an evening patrol. They're accompanied by police community support officers. They can report crimes, but they don't have the power to arrest. And you've got a visible presence now. It doesn't take long before we witness the effect Salim's group has on some local youth. So they've just literally moved off. As soon as they saw the high vises, uh, it made them think twice. And that's the whole purpose of the street watch, is to provide that visible presence so that young lads, even girls, who might be engaging in antisocial behaviour, uh, will think twice about what they're doing. These streets are also deadly invisible boundaries. Battle lines in gang turf wars over territory. You must have heard about postcode wars in Birmingham. So people living in certain areas fighting each other just for the simple fact of the area they live in. And what happens is young people join up with these gangs and they fight with people, rival gangs in other postcode areas. A couple of months ago, there was an incident in an entertainment complex called Star City. It's about a 10 minutes drive from here. And what happened was an argument happened in the cinema area. Uh, and soon after that, you know, gangs, uh, you know, sort of like came to, came to the cinema or to the complex. Pulled out machetes. Were running machetes. Riot, machetes. Now, young people, when this happens, they get filmed. It gets put on Snapchat, Instagram, whatever tools they're using, and their egos are damaged. So then it becomes a necessity for them to go and repair their egos, to go and repair their reputations, and go and do something in revenge to show actually I'm stronger than that. You know, I might have got beaten up once, but I went and stabbed this guy. So where is he now? Kids are also turning to this type of lethal violence because of what they see and hear. Drill music is a UK version of gangster rap. Birmingham gangs are using it to send messages to each other that include challenges and even threats to kill. It came out of the gangster rap in Ported to the UK from Los Angeles. One of the first to pick it up here was local Birmingham rapper Zimbo. I would say I was the first man to do UK gangster rap. There was people doing UK rap, but I was doing I was the first one to bring UK gangster rap. This is Zimbo at the height of his fame back in the early 2000s. But for him, this wasn't just music. But the area that we was coming from, I would say it's a very poor environment. Most of us um, had, we were in the house without a father, no positive, or, or any form of positive male role models. And the role models that I took on were gangsters, but had the, um, the implementation of the gangster culture, which came through um, American gangster rap and it resonated with us because it was people that was coming from the struggle, just like us, but they was, they was fighting to survive, killing, shooting, robbing to survive. So I took on those aspirations. What did that mean in terms of weapons, knives, guns, we or attacks? Or... Like at, for me, at, at first it was like, yo, it was just minor fights. But yo, then nobody wants to get beat up, so we started carrying knives and then we started carrying guns. 
we could get we got, we got our hand from guns just like carrying guns and having shoot out. Really? Fun. Zimbo, whose real name is Simeon, ended up going to jail seven times for offences ranging from drugs, firearms, dangerous driving and violence. What we are showed is that to become successful, because the images that we see of success of ourselves is that you've got to be a bad boy, you've got to be a gangster, and that will bring you success. But you don't see the reality of it. You might get a few chains, you might get a car, you might get some girls, you might have a gun, you know, you might have people fearing you, but you don't see, you, you don't see your friend's face getting blown off, you don't see your friend getting stabbed to, to death, you don't see, you don't see yourself going in and out of jail, spending your life in jail, and, 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 and like doing 30 years in prison. Simeon offered to take us to a recording studio to show us how mainstream rap and drill culture okay. is feeding knife crime. All right, Devin. The track he's about to show us is from an American gangster rapper called C. Bo. Oh, go on, put it on. It's one night seven on the motherfucking hook. Nigga out of bounds. Pause it. So it's basically just talking about killing, I'm going to say killing niggas, because that's what he's talking about. In di and when we're saying, uh, and I'm talking about black people killing, Black folks, young black men. And that's what that's them. encouraging. That's what it's. That's exactly what it's encouraging. Okay. Nothing else. It's not the actual music or even the genre. For me, it's the message, the mental programming within the music, and this is the mental programming that we've been getting for over two decades. We we wrap it up in gold gloss and sexy girls and feed it to the public. So this, what kind of impression is this given to many of the young people? Simeon's solution is to change the message. Knife crime, he believes, is a symptom, not the disease itself. We've got a wide um, spread now of knife crime because of Snapchat and that. That's bullshit. We've got a wide spread of this shit because they're, they're making it harder for us to live. The poverty lines are much bigger. The, the lines between poverty and the rich are much bigger. This is the reality. So if, you, if, you, if you're creating the environment and the systems and the structures to facilitate this shit, of course it's gonna happen. That's my thing. So my message to the powers that be is that shit needs to change. Twenty years ago, Birmingham had a fearsome reputation as the UK's gun crime capital. 108 murders in just four years. If possible, I would like all of this. Gangs were killing each other. On the front line of the police response was homicide detective Kirk Dawes. I'll tell you what, given the fact that it is supposed to be violence, yeah, you're putting your stat proofs on. At the height of Birmingham's gun crime epidemic, Kirk was tasked with finding a solution. Drawing on mediation in Northern Ireland, Kirk realised he had to talk to the criminals to stop the violence. Hello, Kirk. Oh, yeah, Evan. How Hi, you? how are you doing? I'll turn my camera on. So, you know, thanks for agreeing to the interview from isolation. Just to start with, with the UK still a few days away from total lockdown, as a precaution, we interview Kirk via Skype. So we wrote this model, a model of transformation from comfort to peace. I've got villains, some were youth workers, some were social workers, retired cops, a lot of women, mums who had lost kids. His programme was based on two things, good local police intelligence, then direct intervention to break the cycle of revenge. None of these people really want to die themselves. Mm. So you make it a reality, yeah? I used to say to the mediators, you've got to get into their heads. There's two ways of dominating them. You can either go to the grave or you can go to prison for 35 years mm. to live in death. This radical approach brought Birmingham's murder rate tumbling down from around four per month in 2004 to zero in 2011. So, so then th that was working, that was getting the numbers down. Then what happened to the programme? Changed government. Almost immediately, under the 
I, mean, I will say the guise of austerity. Uh, the government tried to pull everything back, so consequently, new clubs, new services, uh, things like the mediation teams, mentoring interventions, and all of that really got pulled. But there was an opportunity lost, and money became bigger than lives. As they battle record knife crime, West Midlands police now say they are trying to restart a version of Kirk's mediation program. It's part of a new $13 million program aimed at curbing knife crime through prevention and more policing. But it's yet to yield tangible results. I'm in Birmingham where before the global pandemic, the most pressing issue was out of control knife crime. Local Brummy Ray Ann was once a shoplifter. Now she's a youth worker. She believes a vital first step to lowering knife crime is getting kids off the streets. It's, I think personally, it's just important for one to get, give young people a space, their own space, rather than out on the streets as well as offering them opportunities to reach their goals and aspirations and even give them a skill set and confidence. We're on our way to the outer suburb of Bromsgrove, where teenagers who usually have nothing to do can now express their creativity. I believe these workshops help decrease knife crime by, one, engaging and building relationships with young people where they've got responsible role models that they can come and speak to and have these critical conversations with. And of course, it's giving them vision. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's two people there that are working with them, that have got faith in them, that can see that they've got potential. To help, Rayanne has teamed up with rapper Nathaniel. Like many here, he's personally suffered from knife crime. When I turned 16, my cousin was fatally stabbed. He wasn't gang affiliated or anything. It was just oh. a dispute. He had an altercation with somebody, he had a fair fight. And as he walked off, the guy had brandished a knife and stabbed my cousin in the back. Why are they using knives, particularly young people today, in this way? I say, OK, I, well, OK. Well, firstly, I think that they're easily accessible. You know, if you have an issue and you wanted to get somebody back, you could go into your kitchen and a knife is there. Secondly, I feel like knife crime is very um, glorified by uh, rap artists. We, we're starting to realise now that this is a, a generational thing, it's a cultural thing. It's not just in your deprived areas or that area. It's everywhere now, mm. you know. Before these young people get into the cusp of, oh, we're going to be gang affiliated or whatever, we're trying to create a workshop where these young people can come. 82 never knew my Ma J was doing crack. Now it makes my heart break when I think of all the crap that happened in the past. Age three, my nan took me away by the sea. Got moved into care because she came a fiend. Age four, felt like I was bleeding out. This is this music shop as a result of these guys. These are bastards. So it was your idea. Yeah. Oh. So why why is something like this? You you said why why do you like doing it? There's something to do. Because if like there's nothing to do, then we'll get in trouble. What sort of trouble? Like. There's just loads of like gang, like just nice stuff like that, drugs, like just anything. Even like, minor stuff like wetting up paper tissue and throwing it at a taxi. <laughs> Yeah. Self-esteem is a massive thing, confidence mm. is a massive thing. It's not just about music. Through their music, I'll be able to hear certain stuff that I'll be able to challenge them. So, oh, so I've, I've seen that lyric, and what's going on? And they feel comfortable enough to talk to me about right, it. And okay. I'm always open mm. to give them a positive mm. feedback and, and, you know, and to, to help them. But I couldn't just leave, yeah, I couldn't just go. And if I ever tried to leave it, I'd get punched in the nose. And yeah, my body was Since our filming, coronavirus has shut down these sessions. And despite Rayanne's attempts to keep them going online, surrounded by the same temptations, several of these kids have since been caught up in trouble on the street. My pain runs deeper than the ocean. Raps the only time I'll be open. This life ain't the one that I've chosen. This life ain't the one that I've chosen. Lynn Baird also didn't choose this path, but it's one that's motivated her to try and make a change. She wants to make sure people like her son, Dan, are not left bleeding to death on the streets. 
Over that weekend when we lost Anne, there was another three stabbings, three murders over that very weekend. And I, I just couldn't get my head around it. What still haunts Lynn the most is that her son bled out within minutes and no one knew what to do to stop it. I just started researching different things and looking for some trauma bandage. And then I started looking at military sites and things like that. She eventually found a company making bleed control kits. With a bit of publicity and ambulance and police backing, Birmingham has started rolling them out. And today, she's witnessing first responders being trained how to use them. When we made these kits, we wanted obviously people to, to give people as much training as we possibly can, but we also wanted them to be able to be used by someone who hasn't seen the kit before, or has never picked up a tourniquet. Do you think that if this equipment had been available in the pub, that it might have been able to save Dan's life? I do, I do. And that, that is what drives me every day to get these kits out there. And it's not only in, in pubs and clubs. I mean, accidents happen all the time. How many people have bled to death because an ambulance hasn't been able to get to them? These simple kits have recently been adopted by parts of London and other cities around the UK. I'm just happy, happy that, that more people are taking that on board because I didn't want anybody else to die. Just from something as simple as not having that kind of equipment and nobody knowing what to do. You know, and, and that's what that's what kept me going and it still does now. Since the stay-at-home orders came into effect in March, knife crime dramatically declined. Oh, so we've only had one job tonight. Perhaps uh, the coronavirus is keeping people at home. They're following the advice that the government's given them. As a result of that, they're not getting intoxicated and, and it's not leading to fights resulting in knife injuries as it was perhaps two, three weeks ago. As the UK starts to gradually lift its coronavirus restrictions, Birmingham police have now issued a warning that there could be a surge in knife crimes as rival gangs again return to the streets.